Jesus said, the greatest job is the servant of all. In our quest for the marks of mature spirituality and leadership ability, we must not bypass that quality which so completely characterized the life of Jesus Christ, the quality of unselfish servanthood. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Apostle Paul added to this focus when he wrote, each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but the interests of others as well. But then pointing to the Savior as our great example, he quickly added, You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. Paul then followed this exhortation with a strong reminder of the humiliation of Christ, who though being God a very God, emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. There is no question that if we as Christians are going to grow and mature into Christ-like character, we must experience progress in giving of ourselves in ministry to and for others. While we can and should find comfort and encouragement in Christ, when properly grasped, that comfort should propel us into servants of the Savior and one another. Servant living stands opposed to the primary concerns we see today where the focus of our culture and society is more on our own personal happiness and comfort. The preoccupation with self today is readily seen in slogans like, Be all you can be, or experience your potential and in the titles and subtitles of books like The Christian Secret of a Happy Life, The Total Woman, Joy in Sex, More Joy in Sex, and the list goes on and on. While many of these books may contain biblical truth or genuine help in dealing with certain problems people face as human beings, the message whether explicit or implicit, suggests the prime goal we should be pursuing is our own comfort and the experience of some form of self-expression rather than growth in the character and quality of the life of the Savior. Simply put, our modern-day society, and this includes a great number of Christians, is focused on making satisfaction its goal, Indeed, it's religion. There is much more concern for self-fulfillment than for pleasing God and truly serving Him and others as seen in the life of Jesus. Typical of today is the enormous number of how-to books not just for the secular world, but for the Christian community. These are aimed at directing us to more successful relationships becoming more of a person, realizing one's potential, experiencing more thrills each day, whipping ourselves into shape, improving our diet, managing our money, and on it goes. Again, while many of these things are important and have their place, it does take the focus off what is truly the heart of Christianity knowing and loving God, and out of that resource and relationship, living as servants in the power of the Spirit according to the example of Christ. But what exactly is servanthood? Servanthood is the state, condition, or quality of one who lives as a servant. Further, a servant is first of all one who is under submission to another. For Christians, this means submission to God first, and then submission to one another. Then, as one in submission, a servant is one who seeks to meet the real needs of others, or of the person he is serving. To put it another way, 
Servanthood is the condition or state of being a servant to others, of ministry to others rather than the service of self. It means willingly giving of oneself to minister for and to others and to do whatever it takes to accomplish what is best for another. However, when serving others and their needs, if the underlying motive and goal is some form of self-love, like the praise of others for the service rendered, then one's service is in reality hypocritical. This type of service is really aimed at serving selfish ends, usually in the futile pursuit of personal significance through something like praise, power, or status. Christ's plan, and that which produces maximum blessing to the world, and the church is servanthood. A servant is one who, even when in positions of leadership seeks to lead and influence others through lives given in ministry for the blessing of others and their needs. As the following passages will demonstrate, the Lord Jesus came as a servant with the commitment to serve. Just think, if he had come to be served, our redemption could and would never have taken place. Likewise, our failure to live as servants throws up a huge barrier to effective ministry as representatives of the Lord Jesus. Components of Servanthood from New Testament Passages Since servant living was epitomized so completely by the Lord Jesus, we would naturally expect a number of passages to explicitly deal with this issue. While space will not allow an in-death exegesis, it is hoped that the following highlights drawn from several New Testament passages will draw our attention to a few vital principles that describe the spiritually mature quality of living as servants. Matthew 20 verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling down she asked something from him. He said to her, What do you want? She said, Permit these two sons of mine to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He told them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. Rather, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the other ten heard this, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in high position use their authority over them. It must not be this way among you, but whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. A consideration of Matthew 20 verses 20-28 20 to 28 shows us that there are basically two options open for people. Either we will seek to serve ourselves, a choice that nullifies our capacity to live as disciples, or we will learn to live as servants out of a faith relationship with God through Christ. In Matthew 6, the Lord stated it this way, No one is able to serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. No one is able to serve God and possessions. When we serve money, 
we are really serving ourselves and our own desires for what we think money will purchase like significance, power, pleasure, security, or status. Money is not evil and having it is not evil, but if it becomes our master, it controls our values, priorities, and pursuits rather than God, and that is evil. Christ shows that his organization or organism, the body of Christ, is to function on the basis of service or servant-like ministry to others. Spiritually mature people who experience his life are those who have first of all developed a servant's heart like that of the Savior. Thus, a true concept of mature Christian leadership means serving one's followers and teaching them by example to be servants of others. A mother approached the Lord, probably at the request of her sons, and sought a position of status for them. Why? Foolishly thinking that such status would give them happiness and significance, they wanted positions of authority, praise, and power. Our Lord's answer showed that first of all they had been wrongly influenced by the attitudes of the world. Rather than thinking with the mind of Christ, as his disciples should think, they were thinking like an unregenerate world. Thus, if they were to serve as his disciples, their thinking and orientation needed drastic transformation. Naturally, the model for mature spirituality and leadership and all Christian living is the Lord Jesus. It is instructive to note that in this context of serving, he spoke of himself as the Son of Man. This was a favorite designation of himself, one used some ninety times, and as a messianic title, which linked him to the earth and to his mission, but it also stressed his preeminence, dignity, and authority also. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. This messianic title draws our attention to his awesome humility, as one who, though God of very God and Messiah himself, came in order to serve and to give his life a ransom. In other words, he came to serve in order to set men free to be the people God had created them to be. Since in this passage the Lord was correcting the thinking of his disciples, this clearly illustrates how we need to spend time with him in his word that we might allow his life and the teaching of scripture to transform our thinking and thus our sources of trust, aspirations, and actions also. Not to try to be like the Lord of all, like Satan tries to do, but to try to be like the servant of all, like Jesus and Paul tried to teach us to do instead. When the other disciples got wind of the request of the two, they became indignant and a certain degree of division occurred among the disciples. This shows how longing and striving for position, power, and praise quickly ruins relationships in the body of Christ and creates disunity and division. Servant living does the opposite. Principle, the purpose of serving others is to set them free to love and serve God, not to make them our servants or to serve our wants or needs. We are all responsible to serve one another, but never in order to be served or to satisfy our immature cravings. Matthew 23 verses 11 to 12. Jesus said, The greatest among you will be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. 
Greatness in God's kingdom is never to be found in position or power, or in the praise and opinions of men, but in servant-like service to others. We see again that one of the greatest hindrances to service or servant living is the desire for some form of exaltation, position, praise, prestige, and power. Those who take the secular route so typical of the world and who exalt themselves will eventually be humbled. They will not only eventually lose the very status they seek, but if they are believers, they will also lose rewards in the kingdom. Following the statement of verses 11 to 12, the Lord began to pronounce woes on the Pharisees who typically longed for status and praise. These woes illustrate some of the consequences when men fail to live as servants. Luke 22 verses 24 to 30. A dispute also started among them over which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But it must not be like that with you. Instead the one who is greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater the one who is seated at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is seated at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are the ones who have remained with me in my trials. Thus I grant to you a kingdom, just as my Father granted to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The setting here is that of the Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper, both of which spoke of Christ and his person and work as the suffering servant who would die for our sin. This scene presents a graphic picture of how preoccupation with self-centered interests, position, praise, and acceptance by others ruins our capacity to even properly worship and relate to the person and work of the Savior. Because they were seeking their happiness and significance by trying to manage their own affairs, they were blinded to what he was seeking to teach them and to what his life meant to them. Servant living will be rewarded in the future. One of the hindrances to servant living is man's impatience and his desire to be served now. Therefore, one of the keys to effective service is faith and constant orientation with the weight of eternity. When we seek our reward now through the praise of men as did the Pharisees, we lose the power of God on our lives and ministries, and we lose rewards in the future. But why do we do that? In unbelief, we turn from resting in God's wisdom to our own foolishness through which we seek to handle life by our own plans or machinations. John 13 verses 1 to 5 and 12 to 17. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his time had come to depart from this world to the Father. He had loved his own who were in the world, and now he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that he should betray Jesus. Jesus, because he knew that the Father had handed things over to him, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, got up from the meal, 
removed his outer clothes, took a towel, and tied it around himself. He poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel he had wrapped around himself. So when Jesus had washed their feet and put his outer clothing back on, he took his place at the table again and said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and do so correctly, for that is what I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. You should do just as I have done for you. I tell you this solemn truth. The slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent as a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you understand these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Perhaps no passage illustrates the source and nature of the heart of a servant more than John 13. Here, in the upper room on the night before his crucifixion, the Lord Jesus dramatically drove home the issue and nature of what it means to be a servant. Imagine the scene. All had been prepared for this last meal with the disciples with the exception of one thing. According to the custom of the day a servant, with a basin of water and towel in hand, would wash the feet of the guests who had walked down the dirty, dusty roads of Palestine. But who would take the position of this servant and perform the task? I can just see the disciples looking around expecting someone else to do this, but never for a moment considering it himself. Then out of the blue, as a perfect picture and lesson of servanthood, the Lord Jesus rose to the task, laid aside his outer garment, put a towel around his waist, took water in a basin and began washing the feet of the disciples, all of which was a fitting analogy of yielding his privileges and assuming the role of a slave. First, we should note that the source of Jesus' actions lay in his knowledge and security of who he was and where he was going. Jesus was completely aware of his sovereign authority, his origin, and coming destiny as he submitted and depended by faith in what the Father was doing. Thus, in that confidence, he voluntarily took the place of a slave and washed the feet of his disciples. His thinking and action contrasts sharply with the self-seeking insecurity of the disciples, none of whom were willing to pick up the towel and take the place of a servant. Christ's security, his love, and his confidence in the Father and future allowed the Lord Jesus to assume the position of a servant, an amazing example of condescension. This attitude, faith, and action portrayed his entire ministry on earth and provides us with the perfect example of what he wants to do in our lives. But this also demonstrates how servant living is accomplished in us through faith and understanding of who we are in Christ and by confidence in the eternal glories of the future. After Jesus finished washing the feet of the disciples, he returned to his place and made this very pointed application. So when Jesus had washed their feet and put his outer clothing back on, he took his place at the table again and said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? Thirteen you call me teacher and Lord and do so correctly, for that is what I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, 
have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, so that you should do just as I have done for you. Having pointed to his actions as an example for them, Christ then drove home an inescapable lesson, here defined as a solemn truth. If he, their master and the one they worshipped, assumed the role of a servant to minister to others, then certainly they must likewise take the towel of servanthood as a minister to others rather than seek to elevate themselves. Ironically, and contrary to the thinking of the world, true blessing comes in serving others. I tell you the solemn truth, the slave is not greater than his master nor is the one who is sent as a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you understand these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Philippians 2 If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort provided by love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection or mercy, Complete my joy and be of the same mind, by having the same love, being united in spirit, and having one purpose. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but the interests of others as well. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This classic passage on the humiliation of Christ is here set forth as the supreme example for unselfish servant living for Christians. The Apostle presents the Lord Jesus as one who, in his supreme superiority, manifests what is the model for all Christians. It points us to the humility needed to live as servants of others. Though existing in the form of God with all the rights and prerogatives of deity, Christ Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by becoming true humanity. Christ veiled his deity and voluntarily laid aside the right to use and manifest his divine prerogatives in submission to the Father. In doing this, he humbled himself that he might die even the death of the cross. But the focus we dare not miss is Paul's statement in verse 1 and the implications drawn from this. The main verb of the passage is complete my joy. Seeing men and women come to Christ in faith gives joy, but as one devoted to seeing believers mature into Christ-like living, nothing could give Paul greater joy than to see believers live unselfishly serving one another with the mature mind of Christ. But before the apostle says, complete my joy. He begins by getting the Philippians to think through what was theirs in Christ by the work of God. Literally, the text begins with four, if clauses. He wrote, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort by love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. In Greek, these are first-class conditional clauses, which, for the sake of argument, 
or for a response from the reader, assumes the statement to be true. It is what can be called the response condition. Paul was not questioning the reality of these blessings in Christ. Rather, he used the first-class condition as a kind of rhetorical device to get the reader to think through the issue and respond properly. The point is there is encouragement, comfort by love, and fellowship in the ministry and power of the Spirit, and the result compassion and mercy that all believers should have for others. But we must never turn such blessings into merely personal comfort. The goal and result must be servant living, instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity. Each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but the interests of others as well. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. The fundamental issue in living as servants, as those committed to meeting the needs of others, is a deep-down humility that is willing to pick up the servant's towel regardless of one's status or station in life. No matter what one's station or condition in life, whether king or peasant, slave or free, rich or poor, strong or weak, brilliant or slow of mind, nobleman or common, etc., in Christ God calls all Christians to live as servants serving others with the Lord Jesus as the perfect example of one who, though God a very God, took upon himself the form of a servant. When Jesus Christ came into the world, it was not to come into a wealthy man's home where all material things might be his. The home was characterized by poverty. He did not come into a royal home so that he might be respected as heir apparent even though he has the right to rule this earth. He was not born in Caesar's home so that in due course he might follow his father to the throne. His station in life was that of a servant. A servant is characterized not so much as a person to be despised, but as someone without rights, a servant submits himself to the will of his master. What Paul emphasizes is that, when Jesus Christ came into the world, he came as one who had no rights of his own. The one who had all the rights that belonged to the eternal Son of God gave up the exercise of these rights. He came into the world as a servant who has no rights but is subject to the authority of another. The real test of whether we are truly maturing and learning to become a Christ-like servant is how we act when people treat us like one. Servanthood concerns to consider. In seeking to develop a servant's heart, Christians naturally face the opposing forces of the world, the flesh and the devil, all of which are directed toward promoting selfish concerns and especially the pursuit of significance. Even when engaged in religious or humanitarian works, Selfish pursuits can so easily come to the surface. While there are undoubtedly many reasons for this, two fundamental concerns come to mind that I would like to address. People too often serve others from their own neurotic need for approval or for significance. The Christian community generally understands they are to live as servants, but our preoccupation with our own significance robs us of the ability to serve. 
Part of the problem is that in our society today, such a selfish pursuit is no longer seen as a neurosis or as a disorder. In fact, it is not only seen as natural, but it is presented as a legitimate need and something everyone should pursue. It is more important today that children feel good about themselves than learn their ABCs. But the problem is that the world is searching for significance in all the wrong places and by all the wrong means. A search for significance, as it is promoted by the world, naturally produces the opposite of servanthood. It produces extreme selfishness and aberrant behavior. People today often wear themselves out overtly demonstrating the Christian model while inwardly they are actually serving in order to feel better about themselves or to gain position, praise, acceptance, etc. Again, such behavior stems from the worldly model that operates by a different world viewpoint. As a result, Many people serve in various capacities in the church from a host of false agendas. Significantly, after the exhortation of Romans 12 verses 1 to 8, which includes service to others, the apostle warns, let love be without hypocrisy. Love is not selfish, it is serving. If we are not extremely careful and constantly check our motives, we can fool ourselves. We can be engaged in all kinds of service while actually serving our own neurotic needs, desires for acceptance or feelings of significance or for control or for praise, position, power, and prestige. We can serve to feel important rather than because we love people and the Lord and because we are resting in who we are in Christ, complete in Him. We need to identify and work toward serving the real needs of others and not their neurotic wants. We live in a self-centered society that wants comfort and happiness. It is also a society that wants to be served by others. We might compare the many who followed Christ. There were curious followers and even convinced followers, but some were following from the wrong motives. Some followed for political reasons thinking Jesus would remove the yoke of Rome. Others followed for food. John 6, 15f Regardless, the Lord regularly challenged these impure motives. This false mentality manifests itself in the church in a number of ways. For instance, consider the reason many, if not most churches today, hire a pastor or a pastoral staff. The biblical reason, of course, should be to be equipped for ministry. As Ephesians 4 verse 11 shows, the leadership of the church has been given the mandate to equip the saints for the work of ministry, servant living. But churches far too often hire pastors to be their ministers, not to equip them for ministry. They want leaders who will serve them and make their lives comfortable. But this is contrary to the servant principle of scripture and the biblical goal of leaders which is to help their people develop into true mature Christ-like believers. Leaders and disciples alike must recognize that having the wrong goal, making the flock happy and comfortable, ultimately leads to misery, not true happiness. Many of us place top priority not on becoming Christ-like in the middle of our problems, but on finding happiness. 
I want to be happy, but the paradoxical truth is that I will never be happy if I am concerned primarily with becoming happy. My overriding goal must be in every circumstance to respond biblically, to put the Lord first, to seek to behave as He would want me to. The wonderful truth is that as we devote all our energies to the task of becoming what Christ wants us to be, He fills us with joy unspeakable and a peace far surpassing what the world offers, etc. Why is servanthood so important to the Christian life and to Christian ministry? Well, just consider the very negative consequences of selfish service as seen in woes pronounced on the Pharisees in Matthew 23 verse 13. Further, a self-serving kind of lifestyle is not only contradictory to the life, death, and message of the Savior, but it engenders division in the body of Christ. Service that is at self-serving simply cannot hold up under the pressures of the ministry and the large doses of criticism that often go with the territory. Eventually this kind of self-seeking service will crumble under criticism because it is more concerned about self and one's personal significance than with the needs of others. In fact, if we fail to find our significance in the Savior, we will become obsessed with gaining recognition. This obsession will often lead to burnout, to anger, bitterness, and a heart that is poisoned against ministry. Some conditions that hinder servanthood. What are some of the hindrances to developing a servanthood mentality? As you consider the following, think about your own life and natural tendencies. 1. The desire for status or to feel important is a tremendous barrier to biblical servanthood. This is very evident in the reluctance of the disciples to take the towel and the position of a servant as seen in John 13. But we need to understand this aspiration for status actually stems from a failure to rest in one's significance in the Savior. When Christians fail to rest in who they are in Christ, they will constantly be battling the need for importance or significance from within their own desires and felt needs. Further, this need will be constantly inflamed by the influences of a world system that operates on a totally different basis. We think that happiness will come when we are treated in a certain way, but that's just not the case for there will always be those who do not treat us like we want to be treated. 2. Human strategies to meet one's own felt needs pose another hindrance to servant living. Everyone faces the problem of meeting their felt needs by their own solutions and defense and escape mechanisms. The things people do to protect their self-image or how they want a people to feel about them. Rather, our need and responsibility is to trust the Lord for our acceptance, ability, production, and strength. Based on biblical values and truth, we must, by faith and an act of our will, firmly reject the goal of seeking to serve our own needs and adopt the goal of becoming servants of others like the Lord. 3. A poor concept of one's self-worth, along with a faulty source for developing our self-worth, forms another hindrance to effective servanthood. As mentioned, people often seek their self-worth from the opinions of people rather than by the value God places on their lives according to His Word. 
4. Self-centered living or seeking happiness from the world rather than in the Savior and his purpose and call on one's life is another cause for failing to live as servants. This naturally results in a lack of commitment and in wrong priorities and pursuits which will leave little or no time for the Lord or ministry to others and the body of Christ. Some consequences in the absence of servanthood in our lives. What, then, are some of the consequences of a lack of servanthood in the body of Christ? 1. The opposite of a servant's heart is self-seeking, which leads to consequences like jealousy, envy, disunity, and division. This is most evident in the actions of the disciples. Paul's exhortation and teaching in Philippians 2 is centered around the call for harmony among the Philippians where there was evidently some disharmony. Leonard Bernstein, the celebrated orchestra conductor, was once asked, What is the hardest instrument to play? Without a moment's hesitation, he replied, Second fiddle. I can always get plenty of first violinists, but to find one who plays second violin with as much enthusiasm, or second French horn, or second flute, now that's a problem. And yet if no one plays second, we have no harmony. 2. Failure to get involved in ministry. As was evident in the disciples' behavior in John 13, the absence of a servant's heart causes people to simply sit back while expecting others to serve them. This is what can be called the layman mentality, a condition that occurs when congregations hire the minister to minister to them. The attitude is, we are here to be ministered to rather than be equipped for ministry. 3. Burnout in those who are ministering. This can be caused by exhaustion simple, because a few people are attempting to do all the work. Or, as mentioned above, burnout can occur because of the pressure and hurt brought on to a large degree by self-serving motives for acceptance, etc. 4. The church fails to accomplish what it has been called to do in evangelism and all the aspects of edification because of a lack of ministering people. One of the clear goals of Ephesians 4 verse 12 in the equipping of the saints for ministry is the involvement of the whole body in ministry according to the gifts and abilities of the saints. In fact, this is a mark of maturity. Speaking of the goal of equipping the saints into mature servants, the Apostle Paul said, The purpose of this is to no longer be children, tossed back and forth by waves, and carried about by every wind of teaching by the trickery of people who with craftiness carry out their deceitful schemes. But practicing the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Christ, who is the head. From him the whole body grows, fitted and held together through every supporting ligament. As each one does its part, the body grows in love. 5. The absence of a servant's heart leads to playing power games or spiritual king of the mountain. This naturally leads to bitterness, contention, and division in the body of Christ. Again, let it be stressed that Jesus' style of ministry is the opposite of the world's power-based mentality where certain kinds of accomplishment are viewed as a badge of importance and power. Christian love means putting the other person first, seeking the other person's well-being regardless of what it costs us. 
even if we are called on to play second fiddle. 6. The absence of a servant's heart is really the absence of humility or pride. As scripture so plainly declares, the leads to the loss of the power of God on one's ministry. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride or the absence of humility quenches the Holy Spirit and creates an inability to lead others in the things of Christ because of one's own self-seeking hypocrisy. In view of these consequences, an important question that needs to be asked is simply, do I have the heart of a servant? If I think I do, then in what ways is it demonstrated in my life? Some thoughts on how to develop a heart of a servant. So just how can I develop the heart of a servant that will lead to genuine growth in selfless, servant living? Though certainly not exhaustive, the following thoughts I trust will be helpful in this regard. Learning to live as a servant naturally begins by following the Lord Jesus. As believers who are to follow in the steps of our Savior, it is important that we focus on Him because He was and is the epitome of humility, maturity, and leadership. That which most uniquely characterized Him was servanthood. Even now, though seated at the right hand of the Father as the glorified Lord, he continues to minister to us as our advocate and intercessor and head of the body of Christ. This is tremendously significant, especially in light of who he was and is. With this in mind, let's review the following truth. 1. Though being God of very God, Jesus humbled himself by becoming true humanity and was found in the form of a bond servant, and God highly exalted him. The road to successful leadership is paved with the solid concrete of humble service for others. Even in the Old Testament, which anticipates the glories of Messiah's kingdom, Messiah is seen as a suffering servant. 2. If we are really following the Lord, we will be seeking to serve men. If we are not seeking to serve others from pure motives, then we aren't following the Lord, at least not closely. Christ told his disciples, whom he wanted to follow in his steps, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, and in another place he said, I am among you as one who serves. 3. In the supreme act of service as our great high priest, Christ offered himself on the cross as the sacrifice for the sins of the world and remained seated as our advocate before God. Knowing and being confident of his identity, Knowing why he was on earth as the servant who must die for our sin, focusing of the rewards of the future, and acting out of a heart of infinite love, Christ washed the feet of the disciples. This was a symbol of the service he continues to perform for us in the daily cleansing of our sins, even though he is the risen and exalted Lord. Jesus' kind of servant-like service set an example for us to follow. Jesus showed his followers how to serve, and he demanded no less of those who would carry on his work on earth. Jesus teaches all leaders.
For all time that greatness is not found in rank or position, but in service. He makes it clear that true leadership is grounded in love, which must issue in service. 4. Another truth vital to developing a servant's heart is facing the reality of our own weakness and need. No one in their own energy has the ability to give themselves sacrificially as a servant according to the example of the Savior. For this we need the transforming ministry and enablement of the Holy Spirit and the renewing direction, grace, and strength that comes from living and growing in the Word. Thus, a Word-filled, Spirit-filled, controlled, loving, and serving life is an absolute essential to the ability to give ourselves as loving servants of Jesus Christ and of others. Like Jesus loved and served us as his enemies, he also wants to help us to love and serve our enemies also. 5. Two more companion elements to living as servants are surrender and sacrifice, as are found in the exhortation of Romans 12 verses 1 to 2. The self-serving spirit and mindset of the world is opposed to the mind of sacrificial servant living. Thus, based on the mercies of God available to believers in Christ, the Apostle appeals to Christians to surrender themselves to God as living sacrifices. Essential to that, and in keeping with living a spirit-controlled and word-filled life, is the need for daily renewing the mind in the truth of the Word, which tries to teach us that the best job for us to choose to seek to do is to be the servant of all. Paul said, I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service to Him. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. Such surrender and sacrifice of our lives to do Jesus' will, and our bodies for Jesus to live in, and do His will through, naturally forms the foundation and well-spring for servant living which is clearly God's will for all Christians. Paul immediately, therefore, points his readers to their responsibilities in Christian ministry. The point is that one's consecration to God and a lifestyle transformed by the renewing of the mind is to be demonstrated in giving of oneself through the exercise of spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. Again, in the realm of surrender and sacrifice, the Lord Jesus is our perfect example. First, being willing to sacrifice his position and privileges, he surrendered himself to the Father's will. This also meant he was willing to serve and even suffer to fulfill the Father's plan of salvation for us. Therefore, as he was willing to sacrifice and surrender that he might serve our needs become our Redeemer and Advocate, so we are to be willing to serve, surrender, and sacrifice to meet the needs of others as a display of the mind of Christ. For the Christian, then, this means a knowing the word which identifies the true needs of people and then b. working in the power of the Spirit to meet those needs according to our gifts, opportunities, and abilities. 
It also means caring about people and getting to know them personally so we can help meet their particular needs as we are given opportunity, as we have ability to do so, and as the Lord provides a way to do so. Like spiritual gifts should be for the benefit of others, not for our benefit. 6. Another important element in developing the heart of a servant is learning to rest and find our significance in who we are in Christ. In Him we are complete and blessed with every spiritual blessing. What could be more significant than being called a child of God, a title that applies to all believers in Christ? 1 John 3 verses 1 to 3. See what sort of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called God's children, and indeed we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. But we know that whenever it is revealed we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope focused on him purifies himself, just as Jesus is pure. The Christian's need, then, is to seek his sense of well-being and happiness from his identity in Christ and not from people or from position. Otherwise, even if he does render service, it will often be from a self-serving motive like acceptance or praise. Man's obsessive pursuit of significance produces thinking and behavior that runs counter to the values and behavior that are consistent with Christ-like servant living. It invariably leads to defensive and protective behavior patterns that put self above others. 7. Finally, another important element in living as servants is living according to the perspective of eternity, having eternal goals and values. If this was true with the Lord Jesus, and it was, then it must also be so with us. This means learning to live as pilgrims, as those who are living in view of the judgment seat of Christ, and his well done, thou good and faithful servant, judgment of us, after we die. Following the example of the Savior, Believers are to function as servants who seek to minister to one another in loving and selfless service. A question to try to answer for ourselves, am I, in submission to the Lord and to others, seeking to serve, or am I seeking to be served in the pursuit of my wants? The conclusion of this teaching about being a servant Seeking to promote servant living, the Apostle reminds us in Philippians 2 verse 1 that there is encouragement in Christ, a comfort provided by love, fellowship in the Spirit, and affection and mercy. I believe that the first three, encouragement in Christ, a comfort provided by love, and fellowship in the Spirit, are what come to us through our walk with the Savior. They are the products of fellowship. The last two, affection and mercy, may refer to the results of Christ in us as it is to be expressed to others in selfless concern. In other words, as the God of peace and the God of all comfort, he wants us to have his peace, and he wants to comfort us. But he is more concerned about our character as expressed in servant living than our comfort. His ultimate goal is not to pamper us physically or emotionally, but to perfect us spiritually, 
conforming us into the character of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus gave himself redemptively for us to restore us to God and create a people who would live as servants of God in the service of others, proclaiming the good news and loving others for him. Thus, as Christ gave himself, so God wants us to give ourselves for others. In his book, The Quest for Character, and in a chapter entitled, The Gift That Lives On, Chuck Swindle's words form a fitting conclusion to this study. In our pocket of society where pampered affluence is rampant, we are often at a loss to know what kind of gifts to buy our friends and loved ones on special occasions. For some people, especially those who have everything, the standard type gift won't cut it. Nothing in the shopping mall catches our fancy. I have a suggestion. It may not seem that expensive or sound very novel, but believe me, it works every time. It's one of those gifts that has great value but no price tag. It can't be lost, nor will it ever be forgotten. No problem with size either. It fits all shapes, any age, and every personality. This ideal gift is yourself. In your quest for character, don't forget the value of unselfishness. That's right. Give some of yourself away. Give an hour of your time to someone who needs you. Give a note of encouragement to someone who is down. Give a hug of affirmation to someone in your family. Give a visit of mercy to someone who is laid aside. Give a meal you prepared to someone who is sick. Give a word of compassion to someone who just lost a mate. Give a deed of kindness to someone who is slow and easily overlooked. Jesus taught, to the extent that you did to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Matthew 25 verse 40. Let us seek to serve Jesus by allowing him to live in our bodies, to serve others out through us. Like Jesus said, the greatest job on earth is to be the servant of all.